Hi everyone, um, I hope you've been enjoying my story so far. I'm really happy to be able to read you this story. It's called Ubuntu, Summer of the Rhino, and there's actually a little Ubuntu that goes with the story. And you're going to hear all about him and his adventures, not all of them good. So I'm going to put him over here. Keep an eye on him while I read to you. This one is quite a long story, so it will probably read, be read in two or three parts. Another interesting thing about this story is that it's written from three different perspectives. Okay, so there you'll have to listen. There'll be different parts and different names, and I'll just read you the forward. Okay, so. <clears throat> The story of Ubuntu is by Julia Johnson, and um, it's the story of the orphaned white rhino, Ubuntu. It's beautifully illustrated by Bug Fawcett, and it's very deeply moving. It brought tears to my eyes the first time I read it. Rhinos are, in essence, the last living dinosaurs. Unchanged for 60 million years, those alive today are identical to those that lived all that time ago. Evolution has found no necessity um, to adjust the model in any way. Therefore, in terms of nature, the species has attained perfection for its specific role within the environment. That role is an important one, since rhinos consume plants and shrubs that are either poisonous or unpalatable. Unpalatable means that other animals don't like eating them. Um, and in this way, it keeps the pastures in balance. Rhinos are amongst the easiest of all wild animals to, to tame. I didn't know this. This was something new to me. If you scratch a rhino on its tummy, it will collapse in a state of bliss. Give it a tasty morsel and it will suck in it long after the food has disappeared, savoring the lingering taste for as long as possible. Furthermore, rhinos are obsessive about their horns, which are their main means of defense. They spend hours shaping and sharpening them to the satisfaction of the owner, and if the result falls short, the rhino will even knock off his horn deliberately so that it can grow again and be shaped fresh. In fact, the horn is only keratin. Keratin, just like a human fingernail. And it is a tragedy that some people believe that the rhino horn has magical curative properties. A belief that has been scientifically proven to be untrue. In fact, if the people in the Far East took to biting their fingernails, they would probably get just as just they would probably be healed just as well, and rhinos would not be so critically endangered as they are today, and they would be able to walk the earth unchanged for another sixty billion years, just as nature intended. So that's a little forward by Dr. Dane Daphne Sheldrick. Right. The dedication, this book is dedicated to all rangers around the world who risk their lives to protect our planet's diminishing wildlife, the many people who still care enough to fight against the odds, and the children who will insist that every species has a place to live safely on our planet. So, part one, the rhino calf story. For a few weeks, it was just the two of us, just my mother and me. I woke to bright mornings by her side. She shaded me from the hot sun as I drank her milk, and I snuggled against her warm body through the cold, starlit nights. I remember her smell. More than anything, I still remember her smell. And the air that evening. I remember the air, soft and gentle and warm, full of birdsong and bees. Sorry, I've just been distracted because my cat has come to see what I'm doing. She is. So, hello, Lily. I felt safe. I remember that too. I felt safe because my mother was there, standing close to me, my cheek touching hers as she grazed on the grass. The moon rose in the sky that night, big and round and shining. I loved the moon back then. I thought it was beautiful. Not anymore. Now it reminds me of that night, and it makes me feel frightened all over again. 
Suddenly, the tick bird on my mother's back shrieked a warning. I can see the pictures. Downwind to us, we didn't smell them coming. Dark shapes leapt from the bushes, shouts and shots, sharp and loud. I was afraid, so afraid, and my legs wouldn't move, but my mother moved. I turned to find that she was no longer beside me, and the shapes joined together, fencing me in. I ran in frantic circles. I charged at the fence. I had to get through. I needed my mother, but the shapes jumped and screamed and beat me with their sticks. I cried out, and then I heard my mother's answering call. She was coming back for me. I knew she wouldn't leave me. I was hers, her baby. I belonged to her. I was part of her and she loved me. But she never reached me. I don't want to remember what happened next, but when I close my eyes and go to sleep, I see it all over again. I smell it too. I smell my mother's blood and I wake up from my sleep crying. It was all a trick, you see. The dark shapes weren't interested in me. They wanted my mother and they knew she would come back for me. And when she came charging through the bushes, they pointed their long guns at her and fired. They kept on firing over and over again until she fell to the ground. And that's when I forget, forgot my fear and charged. But I couldn't save her. I was too small. And the men threw rocks at me. They kicked me with their big black boots. They shouted at me and beat me and chased me away. Terrified, I ran and I ran until I could run no more. And we move to Georgia's story. So we've got the baby rhino's story, and we've got a boy called George. There's George and his mum. A lot of boys go for park, go to the park to ride their bikes or kick a football. George goes to look for creepy crawlies. He has a cool bug box with a magnifying glass in the lid, which makes all the insect, insects look much bigger. The best place to look is under the bushes where it's dark and damp and there's lots of dead wood. Lift up a stone and the startled wood lice frantically scurry about searching for cover. There are always plenty of wiggly worms too. And if you're really, really lucky, you might find a stag beetle. George's favorite insect in the whole wide world is a stag beetle. He loves its shiny black suit and its impressive mandibles. That's what you call a stag beetle's jaws. And it uses them to fight battle. When George found one mum, took a photo of it before he put it back amongst the rotting twigs and leaves. Maybe you guys can Google what a stag beetle looks like. Quite interesting looking. You don't get many of those around here anymore, mum said, and George felt sad. It would be a shame if stag beetles disappeared forever like dinosaurs, he thought. George's favorite animal in the whole wide world is a rhino. And that's because they remind him of his favorite dinosaur, the Triceratops. It was a pity, George always thought, that dinosaurs were only alive in his dreams and on films. Imagine watching a Triceratops with its three magnificent horns doing battle with a Tyrannosaurus Rex. How cool would that be? But rhinos were really cool too, and they are still alive. George knew that rhinos and dinosaurs weren't related. But all the same, he couldn't help thinking that their armor-plated hide and the horns on their heads did make rhinos look a bit prehistoric. And they're herbivores too, like Triceratops, he told his teacher. And you know what? They're really enormous, really, really huge, and terribly heavy. They weigh tons and... He paused for a breath. They've been around for a very, very long time. Millions and millions and millions of years. My goodness, George, said Mrs. Dyson. You do know a lot about rhinos. And dinosaurs, George added. And dinosaurs, Mrs. Dyson agreed, and she stuck a shiny star in his workbook. George decided it would be the best thing ever to go to Africa to see a real live rhino. And he told his mom when she came to pick him up from school. But Mum had a surprise for him. Actually, George, I have some very exciting news. Dad's got a new job and we're going to live in Dubai. Not Africa? No, George, not Africa. But I'm sure you'll like Dubai, said Mum. Do rhinos live in Dubai? George asked. Mm, I don't think so, she said. 
but camels do. You'll be able to ride one. Won't that be fun? What else is in Dubai, he wanted to know. His mother thought for a moment. Well, there's the tallest building in the world for a start. In the whole wide world? Yes, George, in the whole wide world, she said. And dancing fountains, and there's a ski dome, and water parks, and all sorts of things. But no rhinos, his mother sighed. I expect you'll be able to see rhinos in the zoo. But George didn't want to see rhinos caged up in a zoo. He wanted to see them crashing through the trees and bushes in Africa. All right, now we're going to meet our third person. There she is with her dad. I wonder if you can tell what her dad does for a living, what his job is. Her name is Kendile. My dad, I call him Ubaba, is a game ranger. And we live in a small house on a big wildlife reserve in South Africa. There are lots of us in my family and we all squeeze into our little house to sleep at night. But that's fine because we spend all day outside. I have three brothers and two sisters, but I am Ubaba's favorite. He doesn't say so. He doesn't need to. I just know. Perhaps it's because we like the same things, Ubaba and me. We like nothing better than getting up before the sunrise when the air is cool and fresh, and Ubaba pulls me up into the saddle, and we ride out on horseback together with his arm tight around me. We listen to the sounds of the bush, and we read the tracks on the ground. Ubaba recognizes the tracks of every animal, and he knows the names of all the trees and the grasses, and he can tell which bird is singing when he hears its call. See those the animals, the wild, wild warthogs? We keep our eyes and ears open for traps. You have to look hard. They're difficult to see. But Ubaba's good at finding them. He knows where to look. One day he collected 25. They are cruel things, those wire traps. And if an animal gets caught in one, it dies a slow and painful death. We spot owls in the trees. Sometimes a mongoose runs across our path, or a family of warthogs. We see jackal cubs playing and elephants bathing at the waterhole. If we're very lucky, we might even see a leopard. Then we come home to the smell of wood smoke and porridge cooking on the fire. Most days I have to go to school. My youngest brother and sister stay home with my mum, mother, Umama. The rest of us have a long walk because our school is far away, but we are so busy hopping and skipping and chatting that it doesn't feel too long. School is fun, mostly. But holidays are even better because that's when I get to spend lots of time with Ubaba and sometimes we have adventures together. The best adventure was last summer, the summer of the rhino. That's what I call it because that's when we found Ubuntu. Remember Ubuntu sitting up there? Dusk was falling and Ubaba was taking a wash at the pump outside. I watched him dry himself and put on clean shirt and pants. He always wears a green shirt and khaki pants so he's well camouflaged when he's out in the bush. Do you all know what that means, to be camouflaged? Can I come with you tonight, Ubaba asked. He looked doubtful. Please, I begged, I promise to be good and I promise I'll be quiet. He looked at me. I know you will be quite quiet, Kendile. He said, but what will Umama say? Hmm? You know she thinks it's dangerous out there. And she's right, you know. It is dangerous. But Ubaba, I'm big now. I'm nearly eight. How am I going to become a ranger like you if you don't take me with you? He thought about it for a moment. Okay, you better fetch more snacks then, he said. And I went, whoop, I ran inside. And what do you think you are doing, young lady? Umama cried when she saw me helping myself to some mealy bread. Umama... Uh, Ubaba says I can go with him tonight, I told her. Oh, he does, does he? Did you tell him you'd be nagging me all day? She asked. Go then, she said, rolling her eyes, giving me a hug before she pushed me out the door. Ubaba had already mounted our horse, Amahle, and he pulled me up in front of him just as Umama ran out of the house with a big, warm shawl. It will be cold later, she said, thrusting it into my hand. Stay safe, she called after us. And I think I'm going to stop there for now, and we will carry on with the story tomorrow. I hope you've enjoyed it. I
wonder if you can guess what it is that's sitting next to me making such a noise. That's Nelson. He's busy talking and grumbling away here. Okay, enjoy the story and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thanks for listening.